big week. We've uh, caught up. Big news week. Stuff happening. No more fires, eh? We can see. Fires appear to be abating. I wonder where you were, what you were doing when you heard the Christchurch news this week. Um, and I wonder what your inner responses were. This is a rhetorical wondering, just at the moment. <laughs> um, responses from different people in New Zealand and Australian contexts were diverse uh, and quite contrasting in many ways. I wonder what your sense of yourself as a potential spiritual carer in a context like that might be. Emergency situations, crisis response and trauma response are key contexts within which spiritual carers work. There are spiritual carers attached to disaster relief agencies everywhere in Australia and there are spiritual carers, <coughs> chaplains, pastoral carers attached to all, for all um, forms of context of res responding to traumatic events and post-traumatic stress. Uh, and of course there are spiritual and pastoral carers working in multi-faith contexts uh, all across Australia. And all of those issues uh, were present in the Christchurch crisis this week. I wonder whether you can picture yourself working in an environment related to that sort of event as a pastoral and spiritual carer. And what your response would be to the various people. These are good questions to ask yourself as you reflect on your own sense of calling, vocation, and your own understanding of what pastoral and spiritual care even is <coughs> in that context, <coughs> as opposed to crisis counselling or um, mental health first aid or medical trauma response and so on. How do you understand your, how would you understand your role in that context? How would you, perhaps as a uh, spiritual pastoral carer from a particular religious perspective, most of us here are Christians, not all of us. Some of us have our own spiritual story that's not particularly religious. Or, But how would you approach someone from another religious background who has experienced considerable trauma and who is seeking spiritual care from you, how would you do that? How would you understand your role? And these questions go to the heart of what we're, we're going to talk a bit about today, and that is your sense of vocation. Vocation really um, thought about in this sense. What you do 
is directly correlative with who you are. Correlative means co-related. So everything implied in this, what you do, is always also implied in this. It's kind of a, one of those beautiful cyclical relas relationships again. Um, what I do is founded in who I am, and to some extent who I am is related always to what I do, the way I function. Action, reflection, action, there it is again. Now this is the question, we call it a question of calling. For those of us who, who are from a religious faith, often the language of calling is appropriate because we, <coughs> we, um, we understand ourselves to do what we do and to be who we are uh, on the basis of our sense of God and, and our relationship to God. Um, those who don't have a sense of God may think of this more in terms of a sense of vocation uh, or a sense of... Um, what are some other words? Ministry. Ministry is a fairly religious one. Um, what about those who are not religious? Would, would, what would you have a sense of in, your, in, in terms of language? Would vocation cover it for I you? Calling. calling would cover yeah, it for you as yeah. well? Yeah. yeah. So there's a sense of something pretty deeply rooted in what it means to be human that's calling us to behave in a certain way, to care for other people. Why do we care? Why do we even care? Who cares? You know? That's the question, isn't it? Who cares? Um, and why, why do I ask that question for myself? And, and at, um, in the same way as last week, when we went back and we looked at sort of a historical sense of this question. Um, uh, if you're in this class because it's just part of your theology degree and you're really still wrestling with why on earth you have to do this, that is also part of this question. Why is this unit, why are units related to the practical application of care, spiritual care, in a theology degree? What's the point? Why would we be doing this? Uh, they're, they're all questions related to this as well. Um, so I think as we ask these questions today, it's important for us to remember that we're doing so in the context of considerable trauma, national trauma in New Zealand. And that is a trauma shared by our own uh, national identity and culture, given that the perpetrator, one of the perpetrators was an Australian citizen. Uh, and <coughs> what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Or what does it mean for us as people who are called to care? And care from a spiritual perspective in a spiritual way. So let's ask our awareness examine questions, holding our context in mind. So let's become quiet and turn our attention to ourselves, the beginning place for spiritual care. Casting our minds back to our first waking moments and all of the moments in between our first moments of awareness this morning and our arrival here today. Asking this question, what has been given to me and how do I receive what has been given to me? Do I receive it with wonder, with gratitude, resistance, acceptance, hope, despair?
And what do I feel has come to me as a result of decisions I have made and actions I have taken? How do I receive what has come to me in this way? With gratitude, resistance, acceptance, regret, joy, shame? responses to what is given to me and what has come to me through decision and action, shaping the way I am behaving today. Is there anything about me that I desire to change? What are the roots of that desire? Hope? Regret? Determination? Creativity? Justice? Fear? turn our minds to the future? How do I anticipate that the responses and desires I have heard in myself will imprint themselves in my interactions with others? gently acknowledge all of this as a portion of my own inner life. I carry it with me into the world of activity and interaction. I offer it carefully through my encounters with others as an invitation to communion, not as a demand for conformity of the other to me. I trust that I will find the wisdom and gain the insight to see when this portion of my inner life has inadvertently interrupted communion and become a demand on the other for conformity. I accept that I am one small important part of the whole of everything. Holding myself with wonder and awe, I trust that I will know the humility of moving over so that someone or something else will have the space for their portion of inner life to grow, flourish and live. <coughs> awareness of one another. How many of you have been practicing that little prayer, meditation, in between Wednesday mornings at other times? Mm. Have you had a go at it? How do you respond to it? Be honest. Because it's, um, it's actually inviting you to some focus, introspective focus on feelings and emotions that some of us find difficult. It's actually something that we easily feel resistant to for various different reasons. Cultural formation in our family of origin, gender, um, sense of what's um, worth doing and not worth doing. There are all kinds of reasons why we might feel resistant to this kind of attentiveness to ourselves. Does anyone want to share? Don't feel, um, don't feel like there's a wrong answer <laughs> or a wrong question if you want to raise a question. I suppose um, it's probably not what you're talking about, Chris. I'm sorry. That's right. I just 
every morning when I, I come here, I've got yeah. to get on the freeway, yeah. on the bridge, the, yeah. um, the English Cat Bridge, which always frightens me. Yeah. And then coming out with all the traffic, it just can be quite stressful. Yeah. So I purposely put on a um, song or a number of songs that sing the psalms. Yeah. So that as I'm travelling, mm. my mind is not so much <coughs> focused on yep. all the cars and the rushing around of me. I'm trying to deliberately slow myself down and my heart rate yep. rate down and my breathing by allowing the words that I believe in it that come into my heart and soothe me. So mm. I, I, in a way that relates because I know I do it because of of your encouragement, you know. So and I did it one time when I first came out and I found it really helpful because I really felt that it just directed me mm. away from everything that was just rushing and crazy around me and yeah, it was good. And so I did it again this morning. Yeah. Was just, yeah. I felt so sorry for the other side of the traffic. There yeah. were two car accidents yeah. and it was just a yeah. complete standstill on the going yeah. into the city. So the Westgate's a nightmare. Oh, at the yeah, well there's South Eastern <laughs> Freeway yeah, yeah. Many yeah. Days. So what you're saying is that in fact any activity that enables you to become present in yourself, mm-hmm. to yourself, doesn't have to be this prayer. Mm-hmm. There can be there are all kinds of ways of centering yourself. Enabling yourself to be attentive to this rather than distracted by it. Mm. anything that just happens to be coming your way. Mm. Um, thank you. Yeah. Anyone? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can eventually something like this happen that if you've been doing this for so long that this becomes like a natural way of how you are looking around with everything in life? That's the intention. Okay, so it can happen. Absolutely. Right? Okay, yeah. so for me it happens naturally. Yeah. Every time, not yeah. like in the morning or mm-hmm. in the evening, or it's like all the time. Yep. I can always do this yep. without even reading the notes. Yep. So Christian <laughs> monastic tradition calls that a contemplative stance in life, which kind of means that your your inner life or your you know your awareness of yourself in the world is accustomed to paying attention to who you are and how you are in this context. It's just something that you do. Yeah. And it's something that we do physiologically all the time without even thinking about it. Mm. You know, um, emotions, Antonio Damasio, the neuroscientist, says that emotions are the body's way of signalling to the brain yeah. the state of our physiology. So True. our external environment shifts, changes, our internal environment shifts and changes. And our first response to that is an emotion. And sometimes we're not even aware of that emotion. Um, We become aware, Antonio Damasio says, when we become aware of it, that's called feelings. Okay, so it comes into our conscious understanding of ourselves. But emotion is our body's way of saying, how am I? It's like doing a quick MRI scan of the whole system, you know. What's going on? And our bodies are doing that all the time. We're not, we're not conscious of it. And we talked about that earlier, didn't we? That, that shifts and changes in our physiology occur pre-consciously. So emotion and brain interact. Brain shift changes chemical responses for the rest of the organism without us even being conscious of it. So physiologically, the processes of homeostatic regulation are in that sense very similar to our conscious scanning of ourselves. Who am I and how am I now in this situation? It's kind of, it, it's um, metaphorically linked and in actual fact linked in reality. Um, that we, we, our contemplative prayerful stance is our conscious, attentive mind scanning ourselves, how am I? Who am I this morning? And how is that impacting the way I'm relating with my external environment? Are the people, the place that I'm in, and so on. 
can I start with one? Yeah, question? go for it. Yeah. Just the thing that you explained, I'm just trying to understand. So when yeah. you say it's emotion, feeling, yeah. and if you, for example, if a person's not got the emotion, if they're not connected to the feeling, yeah. mix both, is it then that it gets projected onto the physical body as like a, an, a symptom, so like stiff shoulders or something, or something, headache, whatever? Yeah. Is yeah. that the same, is that's that what you were saying? That's the same process. So yeah, okay. So we are, if we're not consciously aware of it, we can hold it in our physiology. Yes, or if we're not, or if, as in, as with trauma yeah. and post-traumatic stress, the um, what, what some people call the animal brain, the amygdala, is extremely active, mm -hmm. and um, communication with the reflective brain, the prefrontal, mm -hmm. prefrontal cortex, is limited. And in, in extreme cases, post-traumatic stress disorder is disrupted. Going sense. So what's happening is the brain is responding directly to signals from the body um, without much reflective response. Um, so you get all kinds of behaviours that are um, fight, flight, freeze responses. So there's a kind of an immediacy of reactiveness to the environment. But when we're not in that state of trauma or immediate response to actual danger, um, our reflective brain plays an important role in the process of monitoring how we are and who we are in our environment right now. And it's important for us as carers because the way we are and who we are will immediately impact the person we're, we're attempting to care for. <laughs> yeah. So this is... What I do is directly correlative with who I am. We could include there how I am. And this is a dynamic, changing reality. So often we think of the question, who am I, as being this kind of existential question that's answered in the sort of, you know, um, it's a sort of static thing. It's a re you, you are a reality that is unchanging because your reality is rooted in the unchanging God or, you know, some kind of idea of what being a human being is that is not related to actual human existence. Um, now, there may be some element of truth to that, and if we want to get into ph the philosophy of it, we could, but what I'm suggesting you, to you today is that um, who you are and how you are is a constant, changing, dynamic reality. That's what it means to be alive. <laughs> if you were an unchanging, static reality, you would be an inanimate object or you would be dead, right? <laughs> Which is the same thing, in a sense. Not, not exactly. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. So, <coughs> um, this is what we do as carers. We pay attention. Some, you know, some theologians pay attention to the ideas that are kind of, um, um, you know, we're, we're, we, we enjoy debating about to what extent these ideas are eternally true or, or you know, whatever, those sorts of things. Um, but as pastoral theologians, as practical theologians, our sphere of questioning is very, very attentive to this stuff. Pay attention. And this requires, as we said last week with uh, Simon Bay, proximity. Get close. Get close to the context and get close to yourself in the context. If you were standing in the street, well, let's just say, for example, you were in one of the schools that got locked down and you were the school chaplain and you were required to care for the children in the school in Christchurch that got locked down from a spiritual perspective. Brainstorm for me. Who would you be and how would you respond? What would your response be? Can you repeat the scenario again? Sorry. 
Okay, so when, when the shooter started in Christchurch, um, all of the schools in the local vicinity were, were locked down. So all the kids were brought inside, um, doors were locked, and um, their emergency processes were, protocols and practices were put in place for that kind of scenario. I, I have no doubt that there were chaplains. Well, I don't know for sure, but in a lot of schools, chaplains are present. How would a chaplain be in that context? What would they be doing? What do you think? Just give me some ideas. They'll be connecting to like the children's emotions. They'll be asking them how they're feeling. And um, usually, like children these days are, like for example, are very aware of things like. Um, you know, headspace and um, mindfulness things, so you can ask them to, like, um, kind of relax and give them reason why, or, or, or question them why they should go into those kind of things at that moment. Okay, so um, processes designed <coughs> to create. Yeah. yeah. To cope, so basically, you have to create calm so they, they can. Yes, yeah. Yep. Which one of my first instincts would be purely the physical, just protect the kids, yep. make sure they're in the spaces where they need to be. So, look out for any immediate dangers. And so, participate in the physical. Yeah, protect, protect the first. Yeah. So, so, the practical physical elements of any situation, in your view, mm. are part of the spirituality of the situation. Is that what you're suggesting? Um, I think so, just, just the survival element. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, safety, a sense of safety, and you've yeah. tapped into this as well, a sense of safety, mm. um, a sense that things are being managed, yeah. and the... Um, and participation in the physical aspects of that are part of what it means to provide spiritual care. Good question, actually. Hmm. What do other What do other people think? Yeah, I think that's that's true. In yeah. that, in a school, there are so many different things going on. So in that situation, yeah. you've already done drills about how to do that stuff. Yep. Um, so for all the students and staff, yeah. it's just become real all of a sudden. Right. Um, yeah. So it has another dimension. Of what's going on there. Yep. Um, yep. Um, and you've got teachers who have a particular job to do, so you're caring for them as well, right. as the students. Yep. Um, so, I think caring for other staff. Yep. So you've got um, emotions that at this stage will be pretty raw and physiological. Yeah. Fear. Yeah. Do you think there's even an awareness of what's going on at this time? Because I'm just thinking it has how much information you didn't think it through. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's because yeah. the yeah. children may not even be aware of yeah. what's happened, even the chaplain himself or herself. I mean, yeah. social media, I know it's pretty quick. Right. But I'm just thinking it, well, how much information? Is that mm. a chaplain's role to find out more information yeah. that's happening? Or is that just just respond to the immediacy of... Yeah, and I think the not knowing is what triggers the fear even more. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> what is happening? Why are we suddenly closing? Exactly. Why yeah. do we have to go into lockdown? Are we in danger? Are we ourselves? in danger? Yeah. 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 Coping with uncertainty? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what does it mean to be in danger but yeah. not being really aware of what the yeah. danger is? For the chaplain yeah. as well. Right. right. For everyone yeah. involved. So these are all really immediate human experiences that are distinctly physiological. And you can apply them to any uh, emergency in a sense, you know, fire, flood, the storms in North Queensland. Um, you know, th there are any number of human emergencies where we're in danger. And the question is, does spirituality is spiritual care an element of the response 
Firstly, are we being spiritual beings when we're just acting out of our amygdala? Run, freeze, you know, fear response. Is that being spiritual or is it merely being physical? Is it the sort of base physiological? How do we understand ourselves? I think it's a crucial question. My response is, is yes. We are absolutely spiritual when we are at our most physical. Um, and even as I say that, you will hear in what I'm saying uh, an almost unavoidable binary opposition between spiritual and physical because that's the way we've come to think about things over millennia. From earliest Greek times to now, Western culture has carried with it an understanding uh, that human beings are dualistic. We have a physical reality and we have a spiritual reality. And whilst in life those things are intertwined, in the Greek worldview, when the body died, the spirit endured for all eternity. Um, so they were two distinctly separate realities. Um, I think... I want to say something. Yeah, go ahead. So it's this, um, <coughs> it's the spiritual having the physical experience, the spiritual being having the physical experience. That would be a dualistic perspective, yeah. So you've got oh. two realities. You've got basically a spirit, which is the driver, mm -hmm. okay. and a body, which is the vehicle, the ghost in the machine. Okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> right? Yeah. That, that's, that's the traditional Western... Greek philosophical view. Mm. And we still carry it with us in our assumptions about what it means to be human. Yeah. You think though of um, yeah, since I've been a Christian, I've been taught the spirit, soul and body. Yep. It's basically similar to the yep. dualistic. Yeah. And I was taught that as well. And what it meant for us, I don't know what it meant for you, we used to have endless debates. We used to love these debates. What does it mean? What's spirit? How is spirit different to soul? How is it all related? They're good questions because they're first order questions about what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And we used to put, um, uh, you know, you had your body and then you had your soul, which was your mind, your reflective capacity, your will, emotions. Yeah, all of that stuff, your psychology. And then you have your spirit, which is that hidden, silent part of you that is actually connected in direct relationship to God. And we actually put them in an authoritative, hierarchical, descending order. You've got God, then you've got the human spirit, which brings the human will under its authority, and all of this brings the human body under its authority. So the body is the sort of base material that you have to control and subjugate with the spirit because it is inherently sinful, difficult to control, passionate, emotional and you know this is why we resist this stuff because often in our cultural heritage we have picked up assumptions that things like emotions and feelings are related to the body and are therefore untrustworthy and need to be subjugated now there's no doubt that emotions and passions can be unpredictable but in spiritual care we don't talk about bringing them under control or subjugating them we talk with um, maybe Epicurus and even with Jesus of understanding of understanding ourselves as a way of um, enabling us to use our emotions and our feelings effectively in our relating to the world and those around us and this is really, really important, because Antonio Damasio, the neuroscientist, when he talks about emotions, he says, you can have all of the rational information you need to make a decision. So, for example, do I have the beef or do I have the chicken? Uh, assuming I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> uh, there's an assumption. Um, uh, I've got all the information that tells me that the beef meal is wonderful and healthy and good for me and I like it love it. 
Um, I've got all the information that tells me the same about the chicken. How do I make a decision? If both sets of information are purely rational, reflective, adequate in that sense. Damasio says we know from watching the brain that the signal that makes the decision one way or the other is an emotional signal. You cannot make decisions without emotions. That's what the neuroscientists are telling us. That's interesting, isn't it? So far from emotions and feelings being untrustworthy, need to be brought under the authority of the rational mind which is in connection with God, they are in fact elements of ourselves that need to be understood. So you're saying that you can't make a choice without yes. that? Yes. Not it, you're not talking more broader than that? Like you can't uh, do Marcia anything would, without that? Sorry? You can't do anything? Demacio would say you can't, can't make a choice. You can't function as a human being without emotion. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Is that, does that encompass all sorts of um, personalities? Like I'm thinking of the psychopath who is yeah. apparently devoid of a lot of emotion. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> okay, so they could be like <laughs> I don't I, look. I'm not qualified okay. to say exactly what the psychopathic yeah. relationship with emotion is, okay. but there is no doubt that a person who is alive physiologically experiences emotion. Their capacity to reflect on it and employ it mm. effectively in social relationships is a complex oh. question, and, and mm. you know it might be worth doing some reading about. Mm. You know, okay. spiritual care of psychopaths. <laughs> what does that actually mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for me, in my thinking, the physiology of spirituality, as I've already said this morning, can be understood when we think about the processes of homeostatic regulation. constant change, constant adaptation of the physiological organism. That's what it means to be alive. And to be alive is to be spiritual. Ruach. Breath. Yeah. That comes into consciousness. Well, let's not do that. Because that's another assumption. Up. <laughs> Can you hear the assumption? It's like, it's like saying... It's like saying the sun comes up in the morning. Mm. Does it? Does the sun come up in the morning? Mm. Not really. Mm. What does it do? Depends which way you look at it. Depends which way you look at it. If you're a geologist, the earth moves, isn't it? So the yeah. sun doesn't necessarily come up. We know, in fact, that there's no up or down. There's no question about up or down. move around in relationship to it. So the sun stays where it is. Stays where it is. Yeah, so how, if we were actually reflecting the reality <laughs> of the situation, how would we say it? <laughs> We're greeting the sun. We greet the sun. That's a subjective response. <laughs> Welcome, sun. Good morning, sun. <laughs> oh, we knew. Yeah. yeah. We've come around again. <laughs> we meet again. Yeah, we meet again. Have <laughs> different ways of understanding. Now you can say, oh, that's stupid. You know, what would you do? The sun comes up in the morning. Yes, but when you're talking about a, a rational scientific understanding of what the reality is, saying the sun comes up in the morning is actually a stupid thing to say. Mm. Well, it's an old thing to say. It's from a different worldview, a worldview that we know not to be true anymore. Now, implicit in what I'm saying is that the early Greek understanding of the human person as binary, dualistic reality, body, spirit, is no longer part, part of our understanding. Because we know that everything that we have traditionally called spirit has its essence, its roots, in our physiological processes. Is, um, just probably off the top of your head... Is there much in terms of what this Paul sort of talks about there's benefit from training the physical body, but there's much more benefit in the spiritual. Yeah. Is there 
I, I don't want to be simplistic in that. Yeah. You know, there's probably a whole lot of context yeah. around that. But yeah. do you, is there any sort of um, writers that write about this sort of stuff that you're aware of, or things that you've read or come across, you know, scripturally? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we need to recognise that Paul and those who wrote in Paul's name were living in a Hellenistic mm. context. And so ideas of body and spirit and mm. differences between those things were, were subjects, topics of discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and the great dualistic understanding was prevalent. And that's present in the Christian worldview. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And so the question becomes, to what extent does our own knowledge, our own reflective knowledge, enable us to read back into the text and say, yeah, well, we, we might need to understand this slightly differently. Um, but having said that, just very, very simplistically off the top of my head, Paul has no problem with using the body as an analogy for Christian community um, and bringing the sense of what it means to be body right into the heart of what it means to be spiritual community. Uh, so I, I think in the New Testament, particularly with Paul, we need to separate out what he means when he uses flesh in, in derogatory sense and what his meaning is sin and when he uses body, which and the Greek words are, are, are different. We can do a textual analysis on that sometime if you like. Um, um, when he uses body in terms of the physiological reality of being human and its relationship to what it means to be community, to be spiritual. Um, it's a rich conversation in the New Testament and I don't think it easily falls either way. But I think you can read the New Testament easily and effectively to be affirming of our physiology. And we need to remember that the Christ early Christians actually didn't believe in the immortality of the soul. Controversial statement when I say that. Do you mean that? Do you mean yes? What are you talking about? <laughs> do you mean the body? They obviously believe that they were going to be resurrected bodily in yeah. bodily form. That's what you mean. That's it. Yes. Yeah. But they, they weren't hoping for immortality. Mm. Mm. They were trusting in a living, divine God to raise them from the dead, literally from being dead, mm. with a new body into a new life. And it was their same understanding for the world. Yeah. The world wasn't just going to hell in a handbasket and we all live in some sort of disembodied experience from now on. No way. There was to be a new creation. Physiological living organism. So there was never in the Christian idea, well, it was mixed in there, so they were wrestling with early Gnostic, dualistic ideas about spirit and body, but they rejected Gnosticism. And they came down in favour of what was a profoundly Hebrew worldview, and that was that God was invested in life. And life is not possible in the absence of body. So that is the Christian worldview. Immortality of the soul is um, a, a Greek, early Greek philosophical idea. Um, and um, a guy called Oscar Coleman wrote an interesting article saying you can tell because um, Socrates, when he was going to die, he was like, yeah, no worries, bring it on. You know, I'll drink the cup, I'll, have, I'll take the poison. Um, big deal. You know, I'm graduating to a higher existence. Immortality of the soul. The soul is the higher form of human existence. What was Jesus doing the night before he died? Sweating drops of blood, yeah. saying, please, is there any other way? <laughs> Casting himself entirely at the mercy of the living God. He was about to die, actually die. Now, he wasn't about to, the ghost wasn't about to float off from the machine. He was about to die, and it was entirely up to God what was going to happen after that. And he believed in the resurrection resurrection from the dead. That is the Christian narrative. Uh, and it's one that challenges us 
profoundly when we come to understanding ourselves as spiritual beings. And in the Christian narrative, I think it's arguable that we can say to be spiritual is to be alive. I haven't even started my lecture yet, by the way. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's interesting. Um, well, last time I went to Israel last year and we went across the Mount of Olives and there's just stacks and stacks of graves around mm. the wall. Yeah. And um, whether true or not, I'm not sure. They said yeah. that the reason why is because they believe that the resurrection then they will be raised and they'll go into yeah. the temple first. Right. Yeah. So yeah. all these people are trying to get all these grave sites right yeah. near the temple. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the where the temple was. Yeah. Or the, the city. Um, and so it kind of makes me wonder, just when we talk about the resurrection, mm-hmm. um, that there's now, um, from what I've understood, there's a, a waiting time and, you know, creation groans and, and this could be totally wrong theology. <laughs> it's just what I come with, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so we all come with our own yeah, yeah. story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's funny, I've approached a bit differently to you. You're talking about your two pages of theology, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, it just makes me wonder if that's the case, then we rise again. Um, and then what? So, so is that immortality or is that then we can die again? And then raise again, you know. Do you know what I mean? If yeah. it's not eternal, right. it raises a pretty big question, yeah. does? Absolutely. Or all that means. Yeah. And underlying that is a question of why do you want eternity? Is that something you want? I think the the heart of the why behind all that is the, the relationship with with God yeah. um, at its purest form, yeah. which is you know, the, yeah, again be wrong in all this um, <laughs> but the, uh, the old has gone the new has come so new life within us and then um, that is there a new life physiologically a new world mm. um, that we then become a part of um, and that's a complex question because yeah. we know that in this physiological reality death is an absolute necessity mm. none of us would exist if death was not part of the physiological process That's the reality. If we were all immortal physical beings, the earth would long ago have exhausted its capacity to sustain us. So the question becomes, um, what is it about ourselves that we want to change? And for a lot of us, is we're just scared of dying. That's We're terrified of dying because we don't know what it means. And it's built into our physiological processes that we stay alive. That's what homeostatic regulation is. <laughs> Trying to stay alive. These are the first order questions of human spirituality. What am I afraid of? Who are you? Why is it when I walk into a cancer ward to care for a cancer patient that my heart rate goes up and I just wish I could be anywhere else in the whole world. Who am I? Well, my dad died of brain cancer. And I've lived my life ever since being afraid of brain cancer. So whenever I go near a cancer ward, I feel my fear of dying in this particular way stoked, triggered, brought up. What's going on? It's not wrong just is. And we all have our own ways of being in that sense. Your vocation, your call, goes right to the heart of this stuff. Why do I believe what I believe? Mm. And is what I believe enabling me to be truthful and intimate with myself and the world, or is it a means for me to avoid who I am? Do you know what I mean by that? Overcome. What? Just 
taking beliefs, because we're all just have beliefs, religious or not, about ourselves and the world. <coughs> um, does what I believe enable me to be truthful about myself and the world and intimate with myself, which means which is intimacy is related to honesty, truthfulness, proximity, yeah, with what it actually is, or does what I believe um, help me escape from those things or resist? <coughs> Helps me to live in a kind of a, what Carl Mannheim called a kind of utopia or an ideology. These, both of these states of being are states of being that he says, from this guy called Karl Mannheim, in a book very helpfully entitled Ideology and Utopia. Um, both of these states of being are states of being that you cling to when the reality of the situation doesn't suit your purposes. Yeah, that's ideally illustrated when the, um, uh, I think the young ruler or somewhere in the Bible says to Jesus, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And he's saying, the love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul. And he said, it's love your neighbour as yourself. And so, he, of course, he says to Jesus, he said, well, who's my neighbour? Mm. And then he went on to tell about the story about the Samaritan. And that's exactly what you're saying, is that uh, for certain people within that um, society, it didn't agree with them to go and cross the road and to help somebody who was completely separate from their culture and from, you know, from their understanding of um, is even in their place in God's, God's picture of things. Mm. So I think that really fits in with whether our comfortableness in our own ideology or our own belief, whether or not we, if we, our ideology is encompassing all humanity, we're more likely, wherever our beliefs are, to cross the road and embrace humanity, whereas if our belief system restricts us from that, then we're more likely to stay within our own grammar system and yep. stay on, so to speak, the other side of the road. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The Samaritan would always have remained someone of impure genetic heritage and questionable religion, whilst the young man was able to keep them over there and just think of them as the Samaritans or in our yeah. context, in the Muslims. In saying that, it's a constant challenge, isn't it? You know, sorry? In saying that, it's a constant challenge. It is. Yeah. Yeah. The discourse in our culture at the moment, othering Muslims, Muslims are a threat. Muslims are extremists. Muslims are this, Muslims are that. They shouldn't be coming here. <laughs> They're the cause of the problem. Fraser Anning's assumption that what happened was because of Muslim immigration. When you get close to Muslims, <laughs> you discover thriving, flourishing, beautiful humanity that is no different to any other community in its seeking of life. They're human beings. <laughs> Families, children, diversity. The diversity within the Muslim community is as diverse as anywhere else in any other community in the world. You only figure that out when you create proximity, when you pay attention. when you cross the road. And what Jesus was doing in that story was saying, it may surprise you to know that people who are different to you in every way carry within them the reign of God. Now that is a radical statement. Then and now. Because many, many religious people today are involved in othering others and creating family groups, tribes, 
that live off utopian ideology about themselves and others. So we are God's people. They are not. We are God's people, utopia. They are not God's people, ideology. Because the problem for us is that if we actually cross the road and got in proximity, we would discover that our utopias and our ideologies are based on fear. Can you hear under self-understanding is, is, is the base from which we operate. This is the core of our calling. Understand ourselves and understand others. And Jesus was, a, was an absolute master at exploding people's ideologies and utopias, their assumptions about themselves and others. Even people who came to him for healing. What is it that you want from me? Know yourself. Um, really, really important stuff. This person, Jill Manton, Reverend Jill Manton, retired now, um, wonderful person, co-founder of the Wellspring Centre, which is a spirituality centre in Ashburton, just down the road here, used to say to me in our classes for um, spiritual direction, she used to say to all of us, mind your call, it's all in all. This is a spiritual practice. Pay attention to your call. Who am I? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? How is who I am affecting those I'm caring for? Pay attention. What concerns me ultimately? Did you read the Paul Tillich chapter, The Dynamics of Faith? <coughs> he describes faith as ultimate concern. Does anyone want to give me a quick pricey on what ultimate concern is? <laughs> but I thought it was interesting that he said that faith embraces fear. Yeah. Oh, that was a bit uh, interesting to think about. Yeah. He describes faith as the most centred act of the human personality. By centred, he means it integrates every aspect of who we are. Okay. So it's a centering act. He calls it ultimate concern. And in this, he made it what we call existential. Yep. It's a concern, right? A concern is far more deeply related to emotion than it is to rationality. Right? So, although they're not unrelated, nothing's unrelated. Right? But, but in this, I'll have to make this quick because I've got to go and have a coffee. Um, faith is distinguished from belief. Belief's related to faith, but faith is different to belief. Belief is far more situated in our reflective capacity. Yeah? I assent to certain doctrinal statements. Yeah? I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah? That's a doctrinal statement. I believe it. Um, he's, well, faith's a bit different to that. What are concerns? What are some of the concerns we have as human beings? You might want to think of certain... Um, Hierarchies. <laughs> well, I know of uh, one of the characteristics of faith is loyalty. Loyalty? Yeah, so like uh, when I heard uh, ultimate concern means like uh, be there always there. Like the source of someone um, can uh, express, express them, themselves. Let's, let's, loyalty is an interesting one. I personally would put loyalty in with belief. Right? Loyalty is a tricky one. Loyalty implies that I will stick with you regardless of what happens. So 
So let's just say you're the king, I'm your subject, I'm loyal to you, you go on a crusade and slaughter 20,000 Muslims, but because you're the king and you're my king, doesn't matter what I think of your crusade, I'm loyal to you, I'll stick with you, even though I disagree with what you did. That's a quite a negative, I guess, interpretation of loyalty, but that's what's implied in the idea of loyalty. I would say that's a belief. This is a good example. A concern recognises the limits of the belief. Underlying Paul Tillich's idea is that all beliefs, all circumstances are limited. But in the end, they fail. They are conflicted. That's the nature of existence. When we look at concerns, are we thinking like Maslow's yeah. hierarchy of needs? Right, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Self-actualisation, esteem. That's pretty high up, isn't it? What are the basic yeah, That's the top one. Yeah. yeah. So human and physical. Yeah, so food. Safety is next. Shelter. Safety. Love and belonging. Belonging. Esteem. And then esteem. the top one is self-actualisation. I googled it, so it's not What is the hierarchy of You're an amazing man. <laughs> <laughs> Where have we been without Google? <laughs> now, Tillich said, yeah, all right. These are all part of our... These are all natural concerns. They're actually all spiritual concerns. Yeah. The heart of faith is a question. All these things are limited. That's the human experience. None of these things are ultimately fulfilling or satisfying. Even the question of satisfaction is a kind of a limited question. He said, we bec- as part of our awareness as human beings, we become aware that all these things are limited. Mm. And underlying that question is, well, what's beyond that? Is there something beyond that? Ultimately. Ultimate philosophical term. Um, it basically means not conflicted. <laughs> Everything's kind of fulfilled or one, or everything makes sense. There's no conflicts, there's no limitedness. It's kind of a under- view similar to that of maybe eternal life, something like that. But what is it? He says, you, we actually don't know. Belief says, yeah, yeah, we know. We know what it is. It's this, this list of things. Faith actually says, yeah, I I kind of want to go with that, but I recognise it's limited. Because when we try and say this thing about God, we realise that God's bigger than that, God's beyond that, God's irreducible to that. We can't reduce God or our experience of life to beliefs. So what pops into our being then is... A question mark that our entire existence becomes defined by. This is related to meaning, question of meaning. <coughs> and this is what lets Paul Tillich say that at the root of faith is one of the most unlikely human experiences that you might normally relate to religious faith. You know, anyone know what he said? At the root of faith is doubt. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Isn't that the opposite of faith? No. It strengthens your faith, actually. Absolutely. If you stop doubting, you stop questioning, you stop growing, you stop living. As soon as you rest entirely in a static belief system without the questions of faith related to it, you have 
died, in a sense, spiritually. <laughs> yes, I, I just want to say something. And you know what? This is like a classic example of what I've seen so often in so many of like the group, you know, like the spiritual group setting. Mm. So many people they just kind of follow their parents and like families and generations, and they just yeah. go in the belief that this is what it is. Mm. And then they're all just stuck in that place, yeah. and they don't go from a space of doubt that not just because it's a generational thing will follow this, yeah. but more so they're not searching for anything. Mm. And that's very obvious in those uh, settings. Um, yeah. It's very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now, Tillich had all kinds of arguments with other theologians about this. They just thought, ah, he's just an existentialist, you know. Well, what you're, what you're describing is this. And I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong. What I'm saying is that um, I think uh, even the Gospel stories, particularly the Gospel of John, ally this with this, with this stuff. Because, you know, in the Gospel of John 12, 44, Jesus stands up to the crowd and says, Anyone who believes in me doesn't believe in me. They believe in the one who sent me. Right? What he's saying is, if you believe in me, that's fine. You need to be aware that there's something beyond me. I'm this, limited. This is radical Christology, by the way, so don't feel like you just have to jump in and accept it. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah? What, what did he mean? There is one who sent me. There is always the beyond. This. Ultimate concern. Can he also say that we are the Father of one? Yeah. That's right. That's not, a, that's not a paradox. Do you think does it sound like a paradox to you? I don't understand the context of what he's saying as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to. It's worth <laughs> reading. <laughs> yeah. I believe the body and the spirit are both separate, but yes, it is a paradox. Right. But if, if it's all one thing, then yeah. it's the same as being. You yeah. can actually hold those things. Yeah. It's in a sense, Jesus saying, if you're looking at what I'm doing, you know, I'm healing people, I'm preaching yeah. um, the way of God, the new reign of God, the inbreaking of the new reign of God. This is what I'm doing. Who I am is actually beyond this. It's rooted in the one who sent me. And who that is, is irreducible. So it's not unrelated. What we do is rooted in who we are. Jesus, in a sense, was naming his call. I read that as saying, if you focus too much on me, if you start a religion around me, You've missed the point. Yeah. Now, that's just me declaring in, uh, in the classroom that the whole 2,000-year history of the Christian religion was a mistake. <laughs> but I think the reason why Jesus says that to the Pharisees is because he paralyzed their and accepting Jesus as a uh, sort of man, like a God, because... I don't know, but um, they are like spiritually blinded. They didn't accept Jesus, and that's why Jesus said, "If you believe me, you would believe the one who sent me." Which means he's uh, trying to say, "I'm not just a man, but I'm also the Savior, the Messiah that you were um, waiting for, and then the, your God who you know showed himself." So. I think that's the context of the Bible. That's a, that's, that's a living conversation within the Gospels, and there are different stories that might highlight 
the idea that Jesus actually was avoiding being called the Messiah, the one you've been waiting for, and others that highlight that. Um, and the jo- you know, John's Gospel is in particular a rich field for conversation around, around that stuff. I've gone way over. Great question. Time to get some coffee uh, and integrate that um, and what we've just um, shared into your question about who you are as a pastor and spiritual carer. And then when you come back, come back at 5 2, 11. Um, I'll start my lecture. <laughs>